live art talk with Colette Mello, and today we are here with Ian Mello Garajo. <laughs> These art talks are made possible through the generous support of the City of Miami Beach Department of Tourism and Cultural Affairs. I like to thank Elisa for her continued support in helping organize this art talk as well as the exhibition. Uh, Ian is a multimedia artist whose work encompasses collage, photography, and painting. Ian earned his BFA from the New World School of Arts in Miami and has exhibited various South Florida venues. And we're happy to say he's also exhibit here in the design gallery with this exhibition rails, roads, and rooftops. So I'm gonna hand it to you, Ian. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Ian Margarejo. I would not say I've been very artistic most of my life. Um, through school, I went through up to middle school without much art training. Uh, and I went into high school without much art training. And I entered high school, and everybody needs at least one art credit to graduate. And I was like, what's the easiest A I can get? So I chose photography. Uh, after entering uh, photography, I didn't realize we had such a great art teacher who also helped me through my high school experience. Uh, and in the arts, who also graduated from New World School of the Arts. So he was a mentor, uh, Abraham Kamai. He got me into photography. I got my first camera, and I'll say it is probably the best investment of my life. It is this film camera right here. And in my sophomore year, I started beginner photography. Um, everybody did the same stuff, take pictures of textures, grass, up close stuff. Um, and then towards the end, about my junior year, I saw a video, it was about light painting. Light painting is the capture of light in a specific uh, paint-like way, as if you're using a flashlight uh, as a brush. And it was very simple after I understood it. You just click the shutter. Hold it open as long as you can. Make sure everything is dark. Make sure you have your flashlight. Move it around like a paintbrush and close the shutter. And then you'll capture some light. So I took that to the dark room and from then on I was kind of uh, amazed by what I could create. So I started here and it was very ethereal and surreal. Uh, and I Kind of built on this in order to discover what I could create with my photos because it didn't become just take a picture of one thing and then develop it it became what can I make with this and then it started becoming long exposures triple exposures uh, and eventually from these images I would create a portfolio and trying to figure out what to do I decided to uh, apply to New World School of the Arts, and they took me there. Now, from New World, uh, my professor, who was very insightful, Maria Martinez Canas, she uh, introduced me to other photographers, and one that especially was inspirational to me, um, and his work, uh, David Lieb, right here. He use light painting as a way to express his uh, sexuality and he was able to carve out people and uh, outline objects and limbs to create like this surreal setting that I thought was very cool and very similar to what I was trying to experience. So after doing some research and looking into his work I kind of wanted to try my own and I was able to do something uh, similar. So I wanted in this series of pictures, I wanted to create limbs, uh, just an amalgamation of limbs. Nothing really, nothing really focused on myself because the way 
uh, he used it to express himself. I wanted to use it to kind of present how uh, I'm, I'm viewed, how I view myself at the time when I was trying to figure out what it is I'm, who I am, what I'm trying to be. This really helped me figure out uh, that process. And I used the wiry techniques to kind of express uh, anxiety, nervousness that I experienced a lot through college um, and a few of my younger years. And all of these were created with multiple, not even really computer editing. This is all taken with one shot uh, and they always have to be at night. You always have to turn the flashlight on, turn it off, move a position, turn it on again, turn it off, move another position. And then when I closed the shutter, I was finally able to see kind of what I created. Now, it was in college that I got an assignment. Um, this was for gender identity. This was from my photo professor. I could not figure out a way for me to do this assignment in a regular photographic fashion. I, at the time, didn't have any friends or didn't know anybody that was uh, experiencing any gender identity issues or trying to, or have any trans friends. So I didn't know how to kind of step into that. Uh, my professor was able to kind of guide me because I asked, is collage photography? And to me, I was able to make the argument, and she was able to make the argument that, yes, it is. Somebody is taking the picture, you are taking multiple uh, sources, putting it together, and making a new image. So the first time I really explored collage was here with this project. I wanted to get uh, as androgynous as possible with these results. And some of them worked better than others. I believe these two are the better ones. And I thought after this, you know, there's something to collage that really drew me, uh, that I could create something uh, that I'm looking for. Again, it's about creating the image, creating the result that I want. So a lot of this started to be about control. How much can I control my image? With light painting, it's very much, you control the entire image. And with collage, it's how much can I find and put together to create as much as I want. Um, during college, it was a lot of back and forth. I had to do a lot of photo, I had to do collage, I had to keep going back and forth. And I was able to discover they kind of they kind of help each other along, and I would go on to do color photo. This was with Tamargo Joseph at MDC, if I'm not mistaken about the name. And this is the first time I really went out with my camera, and this is the first time I just walked along my neighborhoods, walked along Miami, and I was able to find some pretty interesting things just underneath the rail, the, the metro rails. Uh, what I would do, I would take all the buses all the way up to Dayland South, get off at a stop, walk around the adjacent neighborhoods, uh, whatever I could find underneath, underneath the rails, uh, the pier nearby Coral Gables, and I would just kind of look for anything that caught my eye. Something in a, in a little niche corner, something uh, that's probably out of place. Uh, it didn't really, it didn't really catch on to what I was trying to do until much later on, which I'll get to. And then going back to collage, this was around my senior year. I was trying to figure out what more can I do with this. Um, I was trying to take emotions, I was trying to take contrasting images and put them together as much as I can. So I was looking for images that 
were doing that and I wove them together. I would cut them into very small strips and weave it together almost like a looming process, almost like textile. So this wasn't good enough. So what I did was I took another idea. Media kind of just bombards you with visuals, anything that entices the viewer, any ads, um, they're always popping with color. So I took every piece of media I could find in all these magazines and newspapers that I had, I cut them out and I glued them together. Uh, what I did was scanned it and then I cut them into strips again. And then when I finally wove those, it came the result that I was looking for. It's something so oversaturated uh, and unidentifiable when you kind of just put it all together that uh, it doesn't seem recognizable. So I did that with another two panels and, I, and at the end I made about uh, three large 20 by 16 panels that I would uh, go on to show on my BFA. And then what size are these for the, the final collage? These, uh, these were about seven, 17 inches by, by 16 by 20 inches. And I had to scan them about a few inches larger and then cut them into half inch strips and then put those together. So I graduated in 2016. Uh, I did not do any photography for the next three years. I focused on just collaging. Uh, and the process I would do for that was I would find anything that kind of just fits together. And while that process is very enjoyable and it's very, uh, it's very engrossing for me in my time and in my attention. It, it is not as uh, clear cut in my intentions. And that became more important to me later on with at the end of those three years, I had a, uh, a gallery show at the Seminole Theater in Homestead. But I'll show you what I mean in, in, in a moment. Um, one of my influences for collage was Hannah Hawk. Uh, she was a very famous uh, Dadaist uh, who had a lot of trouble because she was a female in the 1920s breaking the glass ceiling, but she read her work stood on, on her own. And I loved how uh, intricate her designs were able to be. Another one was uh, John Stasaker, who had much more simpler collages, uh, who spliced together these normal images and uh, they just looked so perfect together. So you'll see what I mean by influence in a moment. This next slide here. Uh, clearly from John Stasaker, I loved how he got this, this moment of, of like beauty and just kind of make it rock solid. It kind of just stood there for, for time with the kiss. So I just wanted to do my own interpretations of, of the things he did. Um, I played around a bit with uh, youth and uh, age. I really liked pop art, Andy Warhol stuff. I really loved the bright colors. I wanted to incorporate both uh, human parts and machinery or human parts and nature uh, and seeing how, how they would look kind of just together in this kind of just uh, surreal, with surreal mannequins, you know? This one right here, it's a small idea I had about, at the end, this is kind of where we all end up, not to get too depressing, but you know, beauty standards is like so high, but this is kind of uh, the, the goalpost at the end of the day. Uh, a lot of my collages would be very intricate. 
I had this ballroom right here. Uh, I wanted to make it very surreal. I replaced all of the paintings with eyes. But when I kind of turned it over, it turns into this kind of abstract form and I could have a whole series on how these collages look on the back because they, are, they all look very unique in a very abstract way. So I figured uh, that's a collection that I could, I could make. Now, this was a small series. This was based on humans and architecture. I wanted to kind of incorporate what as people, how we affect architecture. And if you were to ask somebody, you know, what's the first most complex structure would be the human body. And it would be hard to totally take that out of architecture we as people, that, that we as people build. So I had a small series about how these things kind of just correlate ever so slightly to the human body. Surrealism uh, and sci-fi is probably one of my favorite types of storytelling. I wanted to touch on those. Uh, human growth, both personally and mentally, is another one. And we finally get to the end of 2019, which is a very important year, not only because of the show. Uh, this is my first project that I figured was the most important of my life so far. Now, a few of you have already seen these. I want to pass them out again just so you guys can have on you while I show you this presentation. Now, the end of 2019, and not to go on too in depth, the end of 2019, entering 2020, was probably a huge disaster for me, uh, both personally, um, emotionally, mentally, um, where a lot of things happened. Um, a lot of things came to an end, and I essentially had to start from scratch. Uh, I didn't have a workspace to work on, so I was sitting in a room and I figured I need to do something. Uh, I had a very difficult time expressing myself how I wanted to, and I had a story that I wanted to say. So I figured I would do that through art, and I first initially did not know how to do that. So what I was very into was journaling and writing at the, at the time. So I figured, why not just start with, uh, with writing? So this whole zine took about the entire year. The first half of that year was completely just making a rough draft out of paper. I needed to write down what each page means to me, what I wanted to say in each page, how I wanted each page to look. And it was the first time that I moved away from my old work because my old work was just me sitting down, figuring out, figuring out what went together, and then finding some kind of messaging and meaning after. Um, I didn't want to do that. I needed something with intention. So with the working title, it was originally gonna be called The Drift, uh, I had very different ideas of how I wanted it to look. I wanted an abstract theme, I wanted cubes, um, but I really didn't, I couldn't really get it down until later on. And I figured, I have this image of the Great Wave of uh, Kanagawa and uh, how that meant for uh, distress and hardships and uh, 
a lot of people have used uh, this specific image to make their own uh, artwork or references. So I wanted to make sure I put that in my book and I figured why not put that for the cover. And so once I got that idea to put it in the cover, I was thinking, why not just make the entire uh, front image related to that? So I changed it really quick to all this writing came, went out the window and I was like, shipwreck me. I need to do shipwrecks. Going on to the next page, this was supposed to be initially the first two pages together. Um, I really wanted the idea of contrasting time and decay, but I figured it would be much better to have them on both the inside covers. I wanted the idea of memory to start fresh at one idea and then to end uh, not so fresh by the end of it. And you'll see that there's different uh, ideas of contrast between the cover and back cover. Uh, and with these two, the ideas of contrast more come from the composition, whereas the cover and back cover come from, uh, come thematically different. This is where I would start something. I would need to put on a dry erase board, I would get my two images, and I would have to then figure out all the contrasting. I needed crowds versus statues, I needed buildings versus rubble. I needed to put something together that would clearly say these two are connected, all right? So then it just became the, uh, the next page, Crash and Fall. I needed to work with thread. I wanted to try different techniques. Uh, so this is the first time I incorporated any kind of thread into, into any of my works. I think the, the strings make it stand out so much, uh, how it's connected to such a mess towards the, towards the top. It'll say right here, focus on the jumbled mess at the top, and then towards the bottom, somebody's falling. So I needed to figure out how to do that, and you'll see in my rough drafts, I don't draw very well. I've never drawn very well. I've never painted very well, but I had to do a very vague rough draft because I can always fill that in with the images I have on hand and uh, put, put it together into a composition that makes sense for me. These next two, I have what I called silence. Each of these pages were always intended to be titled and the other was Scream Into the Void. I, init I initially took out the idea uh, to, to, to put titles for each of these pages. I did not want uh, these to mean much of uh, anything except to me, uh, which was the most important for me. But I will, again, go back. I, need, I rearranged pages. This was supposed to be on the other side. I needed to make sure uh, that this fit in a linear progression uh, that I would understand. Going on to these next two pages, I initially had this idea of how do I find myself learning from experiences? How do I grow from these experiences? If something didn't work, I would have to scrap the whole thing and go back to it. Uh, so as you see on the right, that that was the initial page of this one right here. And I had to do a whole different redesign. I had to do a whole different redesign for the previous one as well on the right for Scream Into the Void. Uh, I scrapped the whole page there that I unfortunately didn't have the picture for. Now, the next three pages, I'll want you to see if you can kind of see, at this point, I was getting pretty good at uh, doing rough drafts, 
kind of laying out the composition in my head and then putting the images together as I went on. on and I wanted, yeah, on a napkin at Chipotle. <laughs> I kind of just drew it down really quick and I figured these are where my next three pages are gonna go. I have to make a scene of travelers and I want it to lead to something. And you'll see the results for those here. I had to build up a journey in these last three pages and ultimately revealing uh, the last of it, which is, uh, I'm very proud of the last page here, what I would consider the last page before uh, the inner back. And finally, the back cover. Um, it was the most intricate, most difficult one to make. I thought it's very cool to have all these references that I've uh, been exposed to. So the three big ones that I thought were really important in this flying contraption that I wanted to make, I put here, How's a Moving Castle? Uh, the video for the music video for Little Talks, which has an airship, and the music video for the Smashing Pumpkin song Tonight Tonight, which has another airship in it that was also designed by another artist that I love, Wayne White. Uh, and those are the airships here. I needed to pull from those, I needed to pull the elements. I had to say, I needed to look for pipes, machinery. Legs, face, balloons, sterns, bows, wingtails, uh, and blimps. So that took me the longest, not only because of the amount of source images that I had to actually find for all of this, but because I wanted it to be so intricate and how my, my cuts are always very, sometimes very small, uh, and I focus on detail a lot because it all comes back to how much I can control the image and how much, how believable it all looks together. I had to cut these for hours. These very, very small ears, very small uh, uh, textures that I ultimately was able to put together into uh, my final page. Um, and with that scene, during 2020, at the height of the pandemic, I learned to slow down a bit. I was able to write about what I needed to do, but I didn't start on it until about 2021. Uh, so when I was finally able, I was finally in a place to be able to do that, that's when all the searching for images came together and uh, finally making the zine uh, possible. If you're not sure where zines started, I want to get to that really quick. Uh, I have this right here. Now this is the, the master copy, right? I can make as much images as I want. I'm trying to be very careful with this because it's very delicate now. Uh, but it started really big on the 1970s uh, in the punk scene. They wanted to use it to spread ideology, critiques of culture, um, a very fast, very cheap, very efficient way, and photocopiers were very available uh, by that time. So it just becomes putting this on a photocopier, making as many copies as you want, and passing it out to your, your friends, your group, the people you go, you go see at these events. And that's how it kind of became popularized up until today. So I, it, it became one of my proudest achievements so far. Into 2020, while I was writing, while I was still in a place where I wasn't able to do much, I took one day out of the week, five days I worked, 
one day I had to put aside and I had to go to Miami. And during that time, it was probably the most therapeutic uh, time I could ask for. Something I needed after the first time I actually went out. Now I did this for about six weeks. Uh, and I remembered back to my college days when I first took color photography from those images I showed you earlier. And at the height of the coronavirus, public transportation was free. You can hop on the bus, you can hop on the metro rail, didn't have to pay a dime. So I took advantage of that. I went as much as I can go, as far as I can go on foot. Uh, I would get off at stops again, but the, the thing I was interested in most was taking pictures within the city. I wanted to capture Miami how I haven't seen it before. Now, if you, if you have Google, which I'm sure most people do, and if you have an account, and if you use GPS, you'll probably know that it tracks your every movement for as long as you've ever had any of those. Right? It's very easy. You go to Google, you go to where your timeline is, you click on whatever year, you go to any day, and it'll show you where you went. So, I went, I did that. Whenever I went out to take pictures, I labeled the folder. I made sure I, I knew what exact date I went to take those pictures were. And I went back and I kind of was able to track where I went again. Building times. They became one of several things I was really looking for. Miami has so much to offer. And some of it's pretty accessible. Go to any garage, any parking garage, uh, any building where parking isn't really guarded, and climb to the top of it. Most of the time, elevators are not working. So just get to the top through the stairway, and they be, you, you're able to see sites that you don't appreciate from the bottom. And I kind of started to look at photography a different way. I did not think of it as I need to capture a specific subject this way. I needed to capture colors, I needed to capture shapes, I needed to capture lines in a very specific way. I started doing a lot of straight on pictures. Uh, the best days for me were cloudy days. I usually didn't like a lot of shadows. I wanted contrast to be kind of low for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Uh, another portion that I really wanted to explore was the abandoned parts of Miami. Um, a lot of Miami is fenced off, uh, not accessible, and unfortunately that's where like the most interesting parts are. Uh, I was able to find places I didn't, I didn't even know Miami could just forget about entire buildings being there, considering how Miami is being built every moment of every day, how it's constantly changing, I didn't realize that there's just things nobody touches, nobody, nobody thinks about, it'll just kind of stay there to rot, right? I found this gas station, not very hard to get into, very blocked off, but all of it seemed abandoned. There's a lot of tags on every single abandoned building. Um, they always made for very unique images. The 
this one was by railroad railroad tracks, so I'm pretty sure we're not we're not being used. These were in an abandoned lot uh, with a hole in it, which I was luckily able to climb under and find this entire hole just taken up by uh, the greenery, contrasting the very new building in the background, which I loved. And they got this Herbie car just sitting there. Uh, I probably rotting away until the end of time. A lot of these things seem forgotten, and they are. Now, this was an absolutely massive kind of growth of plants. This is where the fence is. I'm not, I'm not as tall as that fence. This is right underneath one of the metro rails, you know? It's just finding these small corners and, and every of these corners, Miami can offer something very visually unique and interesting. Um, and that kind of finding these pushed me to explore more because I didn't realize how much Miami seems uh, to be overgrown and forgotten. This was a venue. Uh, this was not even blocked up. This was by a busy street. Uh, and this even had a makeshift bar. And all of it, they had a mural with a beautiful mirror mosaic that had already been overgrown, tagged over, and forgotten. Now, one of the most interesting parts, this was up by Miami Shores. They had an entire neighborhood blocked up. And I was looking through the holes and the flaps that they had, and I was like, I need to go in here. They had some pretty cool looking stuff. This entire neighborhood was essentially, I, I'm, I'm not sure, abandoned uh, at some point. I, you can see me walking back and forth all the way over here because I was trying to figure out how can I get in here. And I figured out walking up Biscayne, going on 87, there's a smaller gate that I was able to go over. And you can see where R Street is up here. And this is one of the stop signs, long faded. The, the road's long overgrown. Uh, as well as their keep out gate. A very, very old Miami subs that uh, had been shuttered with very old prices. Supermarkets um, just seem to close down their coolers, uh, partially collapsing in the back. All of it, overgrown vines, uh, the neighborhood having a lot of animals, dogs, which were a little, probably the scariest part of it, large dogs just roaming around. But I figured this is, this is related to urbex, if any of you have heard of uh, urban exploring. This is pretty much what I had dabbled in for a bit. Uh, now the composition. I mentioned earlier the way I started to look at photographs kind of changed and it was because I was doing, I was trying to think of compositions at the same time for my zine that it kind of leaked into my photographs. I became very interested in looking how these compositions were flat as possible. That's why I didn't want any contrast uh, from shadows too much. That's why I preferred low lighting. I wanted to make it seem like these were just tacked onto each other layer by layer. So this was just another goal for me. I wanted to have squares and shapes and colors all just kind of meshed on top without, without much depth, as much as I can get away with that idea. And it was a combination of all of these three uh, kind of goals that I set for myself that I was able to uh, 
have enough images to show for this show right here in this space, I would find doors and pathways with no lighting uh, as just the best pictures I thought I could uh, take. Very little color contrasting. And that's something similar into collage. Uh, you want to make sure in collage, when you look at these, I, for the most part, want to make sure no two colors are touching. Uh, I want to make sure each element stands out from each other. And that's kind of what I was doing, especially for this section. And it was kind of with all this um, that I was able to create probably the two, my two most uh, proudest projects, which were this zine of the search and uh, this photographic body of Miami to change the way I do art, uh, change the way I express myself through my art and photography. Uh, and create something that uh, I'm very proud of at the end of the day. And I look to expand from here uh, everything I learned to create something even better. photocopies when he was in the spiral group and um, distort them and then put them in his collages. I think uh, there was an exhibition on the PAM a few years back with Vermeer Bearden and uh, my professors or my classmates already knew I was doing a lot of collage work so I was recommended to go see him and I thought uh, you know this stuff is very much in line with how I wanted to uh, Kind of move forward. I thought his stuff is just like so much better than what I could imagine doing myself, but um, it definitely did stick with me um, when I went to go see it. I knew he did it. Um, he did it. That's the thing that stuck with me the most is I knew he did his with intention, how he kind of just saw his neighborhood growing up, so he would make these landscapes. Uh, with people and buildings and uh, it was all very clear when I saw it and I, I knew that's at a position I wanted to be one day. I just didn't think I was there. Well, I, yeah. saw, I saw that. So. Yeah. Um, and then a comment, one, it looks like you have another exhibition coming up because your work is amazing and you have, I would love to see more of what you were doing in Miami Springs where you're and lots um, and I wanted to thank you for this uh, absolutely wonderful exhibition here that we've all been enjoying and the community has enjoyed as well so thank you yeah no I'll, I'll just say these are they've been amazing um, family members to have around I think I told you the name of how much I appreciated this work I had never thought of these as being from the perspective of collage, and now that I'm looking at them, I kind of, you know, would, I don't, it's almost like I, when you said that, I'm like, oh my God, maybe they're all collage. <laughs> None of them are actually places you can go and see that. And then I'm thinking, that's kind of exactly what you were trying to do one way, and there are, and you also have the collage to, to kind of do that in a completely different way, have people think like, oh, I've been there. Uh, no, it's not possible. Right. But these were all, it's just really, I mean, 
things in and the lines, the way you, your collage, your precision with how you cut things out and your attention to detail comes out in these. It, it, this was the, the first portrait I knew of yours before um, seeing your other work today, but uh, just the way, like, things you pay close attention to how you line things up with the edges and how things are kind of, edges are really important. And yes. obviously you spend a lot of time on edges. Yes. And so, um, beautifully cutting out ears, but also thinking about exactly how to frame the edges of building pathways and stuff like that. So really great, really amazing, amazing work. I, I can't wait to see where you go with this. Thank you. I wanted, when I first saw the zine, it to me, I thought it was all digital. Uh, and then you're like, no, 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 I, I did everything, I cut it all out by hand, and then I sort of took that information to you when I first saw this as well. And that's, that's probably um, the most um, the most common thing I get for collages, is that digital world is just uh, so much easier to uh, go into, because you can change the size and shape and color of anything but no, it's just... You don't ever manipulate it or anything? No. no. If it's, it's all by hand. If there's something that isn't the right size, isn't the right color, mm -hmm. that won't fit into the composition the way I want it to, I just can't use it, or I change the composition around it. And that's the only way to really work with it. But it becomes... Uh, you have to really be determined through look to look through kind of thousands of pieces of media and source material to find what you're looking Yeah, uh, I always if it's if it's very intricate like the ones in, like the uh, one in the back cover and the one in the front cover were all very intricate. I would always have to very loosely put the pieces together, and once I kind of had it down, I took a picture of it. I'm like, I know this is how I want it to look, and then I very slowly take it apart and one by one glue it one underneath or one on top of each other until I get pretty much the picture that I, that I took already. And that's how uh, I create those compositions pretty much each and every time. This would be a weird question. Did you use um, like liquid glue or like stick glue? Always stick glue. Stick glue? Stick glue. I used liquid glue for the thread image because mm -hmm. it needed to create like a seal uh, that stick glue can't really do when it's super dry. Mm -hmm. But I always use stick glue, even though there's way easier options that I could have considered. There's dry glue, mm -hmm. uh, there's spray-on glue, but I've always stuck with stick glue. It's cheap and you can buy a ton of that in 